Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today we're hosting a debate on the nature of tongues in the Bible with Chris Date and Dr. Sam Storms. And this is Dr. Storms' first time on the channel. Uh, Chris, he's a longtime friend of the show, so I'm not going to introduce him. If you'd like to learn more about him, check the description. I've got a link to his uh, his website there. And uh, But what I'd like to do, since this is Dr. Storms' first time, I'd like to give him about 60 seconds so he can introduce himself to the audience, and then we'll get rolling as quickly as we can into this. This is going to be a sort of formal debate, and I'll explain sort of the format after we get an introduction from Dr. Storms. But uh, should I call you Sam, Dr. Storms? I should, we should have talked about this before the show, but how should I address <laughs> you? Sam is fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I am um, recently stepped down from my role as lead pastor at Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City. And so I'm uh, ministering full time now with Enjoying God Ministries, um, writing, speaking, traveling. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm doing now. Uh, I've you know, spent, uh, what, 48 years in ministry, full-time ministry of some sort or the other. Taught for four years at Wheaton College. In the midst of that, I've uh, been married 50 and one-half years to my wife. Uh, two daughters, five grandchildren. And uh, that's, yeah, living in Oklahoma okay. City. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, and I was, I was mentioning, I, I've actually got family out there. So that's, uh, it's really cool. It's, it's a really nice city. And they're in like actually downtown they there. I think they're renovating it and stuff. And like, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of like cool coffee shops that are popping up and stuff. It's a really cool city. Um, okay. So let me give, give you guys just a, <clears throat> an overview of what this debate is going to look like. So it is going to be more of like a formal, I, I, I still kind of want to refer to it as a dialogue. I mean, that's kind of like what we do here is it's, it's very conversational, very friendly, very cordial, but we do have a planned timed opening statements, timed rebuttals, and then we're going to move to moderated dialogue. So 10 minute opening statements, five minute first rebuttals. We're going to do 60 minutes of moderated dialogue followed by about 30 minutes of Q and A with you guys, with the audience that are watching this live. So with that, I'm just going to turn it directly over to Chris. If you'd like to give an introduction, I, I, feel free to do so, Chris. Uh, otherwise, if, you can also just go directly into your your opening statement if you'd like. Sure. Let me get started here. All right. You can able to hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. All right. <clears throat> yes. So I want to begin with just a few words of thanks, first of all, to Dr. Storms for debating me. I'm a huge admirer um, of Dr. Storms, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thanks also to Cameron for hosting and moderating, and thanks also to God for Scripture, the only infallible rule that allows us to arbitrate this debate, also for justification by faith alone, the imputed righteousness of Christ, and for his once-for-all sacrifice. I want to emphasize what we are and aren't debating. We're not debating whether tongues are for today. We're not debating whether tongues are the sign of salvation. We're not debating whether tongues are expected of all Christians. And we're not debating whether glossolalia, the view that um, I, or the word I'm using to describe my opponent's view, blasphemes God. We, we agree that it does not. We're not debating any of these things. We're debating only whether the gift of tongues Paul describes in 1 Corinthians specifically is glossolalia or xenolalia. Glossolalia is, refers to heavenly or angelic speech that is ordinarily unintelligible to human beings, whereas xenolalia refers to speech in foreign human languages that one may not have learned by natural means. And this is my take on what Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians. And here's the case that I'm going to be offering. Firstly, to quote, speak to himself, unquote, is to understand one's own speech. Number two, glossolalia cannot function as signification to unbelievers. Number three, Paul's companion Luke writes identically of xenoglossia. And number four, the glossolalia interpretation is historically novel, or so it seems to me. So let's go through these one by one. Firstly, gifted tongues as understood by the speaker. Paul begins by indicating that tongues spoken to someone are understood by that someone. And this is something that I think is conceded by the charismatics who hold my opponent's view. In fact, they argue that when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 2, that the tongue speaker speaks not to men, but to God, that's an indication that only God can understand. 
But Paul also says that one can silently speak in tongues to oneself. In verse, verse 28, the dative case reflexive pronoun to himself is nowhere else used as an idiom for at home or privately or so far as I can tell. So it seems to just mean to himself in the same way that somebody might speak to God. Now, one might ask why he, if he means this as actually speaking to yourself intelligibly, why doesn't he use the phrase in himself, which so often frequents the Gospels? Well, first of all, Paul doesn't anywhere else speak of right of, of speak of um, a right of speaking to oneself or in oneself. So we don't know how he would write that. Um, and even if he would have written in himself, um, he may have chosen to himself here simply for symmetry with the phrase to God that he's already used. Furthermore, throughout the New Testament, speech spoken to someone is intelligible to that someone. It's all throughout Paul's epistles, speaking to people, those people understand what is spoken. And even in the Gospels, where, where what is spoken to someone isn't understood, what's not understood is the significance of what is said, not the actual words themselves. Now, there is one arguable exception, and that's in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul, quoting God, has God saying, by people of strange tongues, I will speak to this people. Um, but if this is the sole exception to the rule, it's being the sole exception of the rule, therefore does not justify the glossolalia reading of to himself. And besides, I would argue it's not an exception. They understood God's message, even if they didn't understand the Assyrian's words. So putting the pieces together here, a tongue speaker understands what he says, which is comp consistent with the xenolalia interpretation, but not glossolalia. Secondly, tongues as signification to unbelievers. Paul says that gifted tongue speech is a sign for unbelievers. Um, he says that in verses 21 and 22. And I think that Dr. Storms agrees um, that human languages that hearers don't understand serve as a sign of judgment. But I think he would argue that the tongues spoke uh, referred to in 1 Corinthians 14 are of a different function, that therefore don't serve as a sign. But the problem with that argument, however, would be that Paul says the gifted tongue speech he's describing are a sign in the very passage in which he's alleged to be describing glossolalia. If you just start at the beginning of chapter 14 and read, you see him talking about speaking in tongues in a way that uh, charismatics believe supports glossolalia. And then he says tongues are a sign. And then he continues speaking about tongues in a way that uh, charismatics believe supports glossolalia. So whatever Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians 14 is a sign or signification to unbelievers. Signification is the word I prefer because it really emphasizes that this is intended to communicate meaning, to convey meaning, especially spiritual meaning. The lexical definitions of semeon um, indicate as much that it's an event which is regarded as having some special meaning pointing to a greater reality. Theological dictionaries point out that uh, those to whom the sign is intended are expected to recognize something important, some kind of responsibility. But And you see this is how Semeon is used throughout the Gospels and Paul, that the, the uh, miraculous signs signify some kind of greater meaning. But glossolalia can't do that because it's indiscernible from frauds. L uh, linguists like William Samarin point out that um, glossolalia is derived from the languages that people are already familiar with. So glossolalia appears manufactured. Linguists point out that the features of languages aren't, um, they're not shared by glossolalia. So glossolalia is discernibly non-linguistic. They point out that anybody can produce glossolalia. Uh, the former Christian Rhett McLaughlin from, the, um, uh, from Good Mythical Morning recently talked about how he knew Christians that were charismatics and could speak in tongues and are known are no longer Christian and still speak in tongues. So it's glossolalia is easily faked. Um, it's also uncontroversial that all throughout cultures and false religions throughout the world and through history, and even as exhibited by people with neurological damage and um, suffering from drug abuse, are able to produce glossolalia. So glossolalia, if it were a real thing, a real gift of the spirit, is indistinguishable from what's common among cults, false religions, and drug abusers. So glossolalia can't signify meaning because unbelievers that are hearing it have 
every reason to think that it's fake, that it's not real. So it's not going to communicate any meaning to them whatsoever. And importantly, it's the miraculous nature of tongues that makes it a sign, as exhibited in Acts chapter 2, not the th- content of what is spoken. So even if tongues are interpreted, that wouldn't make the glossolalia itself a sign. So therefore, gifted tongue speech can't be glossolalia. Turning now to Luke Acts, Luke is well known to have been Paul's companion, and he wrote the book of Acts after Paul wrote to Corinth. So Craig Keener, Stan Porter, John Stott, and many others acknowledge that the author of Acts was uh, accompanied Paul. Um, and Acts was written either in the 70s or 80s or possibly earlier in the 60s, but 1 Corinthians uh, was written a full decade prior to that in the mid or early 50s. So Luke wrote, uh, Luke was Paul's companion and wrote Acts after Paul wrote to Corinth. And by the time Luke wrote Acts, he was well acquainted with Paul's theology and experiences. There's a full three sections in the book of Acts where Luke uses the word we to indicate that he was a companion of Paul's throughout these portions. And John Stott acknowledges that during these periods, Luke would have had ample opportunity to hear and absorb Paul's teaching. And Keener points out the vast number of correspondences between Acts and Paul, indicating that Luke clearly knew much about Paul. And with all of that in mind, consider that Luke describes xenolalia nearly identically to the way that Paul describes gifted tongue, tongue speech. The exact same phrase, speaking in tongues, is used, which Keener takes as an indication that he, Luke is interpreting the same phenomenon. But it's not just that exact phrase. Both uh, Luke and Paul have t- the tongue speakers offering prayer, but being led by the Spirit. They see the gift as both prayer and praise. They see the, the gift associated with abnormally joyful speech or behavior and a close correlation between prophecy and tongues. In fact, there's a whole list of similarities between the two passages. Now, of course, Luke wouldn't want to add more confusion already surrounding the tongues, which with, with which he would have been familiar because of his time with Paul, so he wouldn't use the same exact terminology unless he was describing the same phenomenon. So the spiritual gift Paul describes is xenolalia. Lastly, xenolalia appears to be the majority report all through church history. Firstly, it seems as if no Christian writers identify the gift of tongues with glossolalia before 1800. Um, That's something that I see in the writings of uh, Blosser and Sullivan, as well as W.A. Criswell. And it seems as if early Christian writers identify the gift with foreign human languages. Um, In fact, the only places where they disagreed was whether those languages had been learned miraculously or not. So we see Irenaeus in 185 using or talking about the gift as as, uh, foreign human languages. We see Origen doing it in 225, Ephraim the Syrian in 350, the Apostolic Constitutions in 380, Chrysostom or Golden Mouth in 400 AD, Augustine in 425 AD, and Cyril of Alexandria in 425 AD. So therefore, Christians should assume Paul's gifted tongue speech is xenolalia in the absence of extremely compelling evidence. Uh, So just to sum up the case as I've offered it, number one, to speak to himself is to understand his own speech. Number two, glossolalia can't function as signification. Number three, Paul's companion Luke writes identically of xenoglossia. And lastly, glossolalia interpretation is historically novel. And that's it. Thank you so much. Wow, you've got three seconds left. Great job. Okay, Sam, whenever you're ready, I'll start my timer and I'll make you full screen. So feel free to start. Well, let me say, first of all, um, my presentation will be much simpler and slower than Chris's. I don't have any charts. I don't have uh, lengthy quotes from individuals to which I'm going to be pointing. Um, It seems to me, let me just make a, a couple of brief little comments. Uh, It it appears to me that the primary reason why some insist that all tongues are human languages or xenoglossalia is to provide them with an argument for why tongues is no longer a valid gift today. Now, Chris evidently is a continuationist and has said that he does believe the gift is still valid today. I would really like to know in our subsequent dialogue what he thinks the purpose of tongues is. What is the purpose of individuals in 1 Corinthians 14 speaking in... Uh, known human languages. Um, secondly, I, I think it's a, a faulty hermeneutical principle to assume that simply because um, tongues means one thing in the book of Acts, that it must therefore mean the same thing every other place that it appears, especially in 1 Corinthians. Um, I don't think that's necessarily grounded in the text. I don't see any legitimacy to that hermeneutical principle. Um, I think we could probably, if we had time, cite examples where uh, 
Um, subsequent uses of a particular term uh, show development and change over uh, preceding uses of the term, but that would get us a little bit off base. Um, if all tongue speech is a human language spoken somewhere in the world, I would expect all portrayals of tongues to be identical with Acts 2, where they are spoken in the presence of unbelievers and are entirely intelligible to those whose native language they are speaking, such as was the case in Acts 2. But I don't see that the case in Acts 10 and 19, which are the only other two places where tongues are referred to. I would also draw attention to, and again, this is a disputed point, um, the, the fact that Paul in 12.10 and 12.28 refers to various kinds of tongues. Uh, Thistleton uses the language various species of tongues. Um, I think a way of suggesting that tongues are not only human languages, probably also angelic languages, and also heavenly languages that are uniquely crafted by the Holy Spirit for those to whom the gift is given uh, for the purpose of prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 14.2 has to be addressed. Uh, I think this is referring to heavenly languages imparted by the Spirit. Um, Paul says, number one, the one speaking in tongues is not speaking to men. But, of course, that is precisely what a human language is. It's like we are right now. We're all speaking English. We're speaking to one another. Paul says that is specifically what tongues is not. Uh, he said it's speaking to God. And later in 1 Corinthians 14, he says it's prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Uh, he also says no one understands him. Um, but we understand each other because we're all speaking the same human language. And then finally, he says he speaks unintelligible things by, by means of the Spirit. So it seems to me if all tongue speech consists of human languages, we would have to reread chapter 14, verse 2 in this way, quote, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks to men, not to God, insofar as that is what human languages are designed to do. And as many as speak that same language will understand him perfectly because he speaks altogether intelligible things in the spirit. Um, and I find that a stretch reading of uh, verse 2. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to 1 Corinthians 13 too, the tongues of men and angels. I know the argument that this is hyperbolic and hypothetical. That's possible. Uh, everybody acknowledges that's a possibility, but that doesn't rule out the real, uh, a, a, an additional possibility that Paul is suggesting that human beings can speak not only in obviously human languages, but angelic dialects. Also, if tongues are always human languages, it doesn't seem um, that there would be any need for the gift of interpretation, as anyone who spoke that language would understand perfectly what is being said. But interpretation is described by Paul as a supernatural gift of the Spirit, not the result of study and memorization of another language. Also, um, if all tongues are always a human language, it seems that 1 Corinthians 14, 23 wouldn't necessarily be true. So I'm reading that where it says, if you all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your minds? Not necessarily. Some might, but many would walk in and say, wow, you all are really educated. Uh, you actually are multilingual as, as I am. So um, I, I would find it difficult uh, to justify or to reconcile 1423 with uh, Xenolalia. Um also, it's, this is not necessarily a, an especially strong argument, but it does strike me as odd that someone like Paul, who prayed and praised and expressed gratitude in tongues more than anyone else, would do it in human languages when there's no one present to hear it. A uh, similar argument comes from 14.5. It's hard to understand how speaking a human language in private devotions can edify the believer Whereas if he or she is speaking in a heavenly language crafted by the Spirit, edification and encouragement would be more readily attainable. Um, also, if all tongue speech is merely a human language, under, uh, it's hard to understand, excuse me, if it's merely a human language, then a person could speak in tongues without any help from the Holy Spirit. Um, but yet the New Testament says repeatedly that we are praying by or in the Spirit. So, for example, if someone at Bridgeway stood up and um, spoke in Spanish while another then interpreted because they too could speak in Spanish, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be needed at all. And yet both of these gifts are described as supernatural endowments by the Spirit. 
Um, also, if all tongues is a human language, on numerous occasions, this wouldn't be necessary as the person speaking would already know what is being said in tongues by virtue of his previous familiarity. And what I mean by wouldn't be necessary, uh, verse 13, where Paul says, let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Well, why would he need to do that? Why wouldn't he just go ahead and speak in the vernacular of the people if he already understands what is being said? And then lastly, and this is, uh, this is not a biblical argument. It's just simply um, uh, an experiential one, which I realize has relative value. If glossolalia is completely false, fake, not real, you would have to conclude that there are several hundred million Christians around the face of the, of the earth all of whom are duped and deceived and are speaking in ways that have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit or any kind of charismata. Um, I suppose that's entirely possible. I just find it highly unlikely. So did I use up all my time? Yeah, you've actually got, uh, let me see. I think you've got about two minutes, two and a half minutes left. So uh, yeah, let's turn it back over to Chris. When you're ready, I'll start my timer. Five minutes for a rebuttal, and we'll get rolling. All right, thank you. Uh, firstly, it's not the case that one sh one must expect all portrayals of tongue speech to be identical to Acts 2 if they're human languages, in the sense that you would expect unbelievers to be there and to understand languages uh, that the speakers didn't understand. There's actually a really good reason why the kind of gifted tongue speech that we, Zeno we advocates of Xenolalia believe it is, would be spoken in places like Acts 10 and 19. And that's because it is uniquely capable of authenticating, or at the very least, it is extremely poignant for communicating that the kingdom of God is expanding to include people groups that weren't formerly within it. So at Acts 2 at Pentecost, we see Jews included. And then a few chapters later, we see the gospel of the kingdom uh, expand to include Samaritans. And then in Acts 10, Gentile God-fearers. And then in Acts 19, uh, Gentiles who have no familiarity with Yahweh. So it, the human being able to speak human languages you haven't learned is a uniquely uh, significant way of communicating that message, even if it's not doing what is generally the purpose of tongues, which is to be a sign for unbelievers. Um, the kinds of languages mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, and 28 does not, you can't assume that the kinds are human versus angelic. Um, we uh, Throughout human history, people have categorized languages. Today, we've got languages like Niger, Congo, Austronesian, Trans New Guinea, Sino Tibetan, Indo European. These aren't languages, these are families of languages. And it's very plausible that that's what Paul is talking about when he talks about kinds of languages. Yes, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, too, that the one who speaks uh, in a, using the tongues gift speaks not to men, but to God. But he says why they speak not to men, but to God. And it's because no one understands. You see, if you get up in front of a congregation and speak in a language that they can't understand, which I did recently um, up in front of my congregation when I was preaching on this passage, if you get up there and preach in a language they don't understand, no one understands you. Only God does. I even asked my congregation after speaking to them in Japanese, raise your hand if any of you under if you think anybody understood, and nobody raised their hand. But then I said, raise your hand if you think God and I understood and they all raise their hand. So the, the, if, if you're speaking foreign languages to a group of people that can't understand you, then you are only speaking to God and not to the people that you're supposedly speaking to. Um, the fact that Paul says speaks of the tongues of men and angels in chapter 13, verse 2, isn't proof of uh, gl the glossolalia reading in chapter 14, and we can discuss what that would mean. But even if we do grant that Paul thinks it's possible to speak in the language of angels, it doesn't mean that that's what he's describing in chapter 14. Um, Dr. Storms argues that if tongues are always human languages, there would be no need for the spiritual gift of interpretation. Um, but that's not true to anybody who has learned other languages knows that that's not true. It can be extremely difficult to take something you know you're saying in a source language and translate it meaningfully into a destination language, even if you know both of those languages. And that difficulty is all the more exacerbated when you talk about things like poetry and idioms and figures of speech and, you know, all sorts of complicated, pious language, stuff like that. So of course, if you have, if you've been gifted with the ability to speak in a language you haven't already learned, you may 
may know what you're saying, but you may not be able to, you, you may know it in that language, and it would be extremely difficult, apart from the Holy Spirit's empowerment, to translate it into the destination language spoken by your hearers. Uh, Dr. Storms argues that in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 14, um, the, the unbeliever might think people are out of their minds, um, and that's supposedly support for glossolalia. Well, the exact same thing happens in Acts 2, where we all agree it's xenolalia. People, people, they don't say out of their minds, the unbelievers, but some of them do say they're dr they're mad and they're drunk. Um, so that doesn't really seem to be a good argument for glossolalia. Why would Paul pray and praise in tongues when no one is around to understand? We don't know that that's where he exercised the, the gift of tongues. Yes, he says, I'm glad I speak in tongues more than all of you, but he doesn't say, I'm glad I pray in private in tongues more than all of you. This was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he may have been talking about speaking human languages in all sorts of places that he went to evangelize people. Um, now, finally, Dr. Storm says that several hundred million Christians who are duped and deceived and are speaking in ways that have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit or charismata, that that's true if I'm right. And yeah, that is true. But all Christians everywhere have been duped and deceived in one area or another, and whole groups of them. And the whole Protestant Reformation was uh, exhibits belief that for hundreds of years, most Christians were duped and deceived. So I don't see that as a particularly good argument. And that's my five minutes. So thank you. Yeah, good job. Okay, now let's turn it back over to Sam. And you've got, uh, again, five minutes for a rebuttal. And then after that, we're going to go into moderated dialogue for about 60 minutes, and then we'll do some Q&A with the audience. So Sam, whenever you start talking, I'll start my timer. Okay. I wish that I had all of Chris's uh, comments written down. I'll be perfectly honest. I'm finding it really hard to track with um, all of the comments that he has made. I'm sitting there trying to take notes and I can't even keep track of, of them. One, they came so f fast and furious. So maybe in a minute, Chris can slow down and we can take each one of them um, in turn. Uh, by the way, I, I, you said Acts 19 refers to Gentiles who knew nothing of Yahweh. I don't believe that's who he's talking about there. I think those were disciples of John the Baptist who had uh, heard John's message, had repented, been baptized, but they had not heard of Pentecost. So it's not that they were uh, pagan Gentiles, but rather that they were disciples of John who were not familiar with the events of Pentecost. But that's a, a secondary issue. Um, your uh, explanation of the meaning of kinds or sorts of tongues certainly has it's plausible but is it required is there something in the text um, you know to appeal to uh, the way in which a variety of human languages are classified centuries after paul wrote this in first corinthians is one thing but is that actually required by the language that paul uses it seems to me just as plausible that he's referring to not only human languages like those listed in Acts chapter 2, but um, angelic dialects as well as specially crafted languages that the Spirit of God provides for people to whom he gives the gift. Um, I remember, I, I, actually, Chris, I did watch that brief part of your church service where you spoke in Japanese, but there's a world of difference between you speaking Japanese to an English congregation in Seattle uh, where it's virtually impossible that anybody will have studied that language, as over against Paul saying this about what happens in Corinth, which was a multilingual cosmopolitan port city where people were multilingual regularly and people would have come in from outside. And if Paul had said to them um, that a person speaking in tongues is not speaking to men but to God because no one understands him, I can understand multiple individuals raising their hand and saying, whoa, 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 that's not true. I understand perfectly what he said because that's my language or it's one of the many languages that I speak. Um, also, um, trying to think, Gus, there's the, so many things you said, I can't even keep up with them. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to, we'll have to come back. Maybe you can reiterate those later to me and I will respond to them. But I, I was just able to write down a few responses to what you said. So, um, again, um, oh, I, now I know what, what I was going to say. You question whether Paul actually prayed, praised, and gave thanks in his private devotions by speculating 
oh, well, maybe he's talking about what he did out on the road in his evangelistic encounters with Gentiles. Um, that's an interesting theory, but there's not one single solitary text of Scripture that ever even remotely hints that Paul uh, employed uh, xenoglossia in his evangelistic outreach. Um, in fact, what he says very clearly there in verses 18 and 19 is he contrasts what he does in private with what he does in the church. It's as over against what he would do in a corporate assembly. Um, furthermore, I do think that when he talks about in verse 28 of speaking to yourself and to God as over against speaking in church, um, I don't see how in the world that is, you know, why would you speak in a foreign language that you already understand? What's the point of that? It seems to me that he's talking about, look, if there's no interpreter present, don't speak in the public assembly. Um, rather speak privately to yourself and address your prayers and your praises to God. Um, so um, it, it seems pretty clear to me, especially also uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 5, where Paul says, I wish that you all would speak in tongues, but uh, pr preferably that you would prophesy. Clearly, in light of what he said in verse 2, the tongues that he wants everybody to speak in that he mentions in verse 5 must be the same uninterpreted tongues that he's just been talking about. And of course, since he won't allow that to take place in the corporate assembly, he most likely is talking about what takes place in his private devotional life. So I'll stop there. Maybe uh, some of the other things Chris said, uh, we can slow down and take them one by one. Well, you actually, both of you guys finished perfectly on time there. So yeah, as we're doing now, we're gonna, we're gonna switch to moderated dialogue, which the goal, my goal with moderated dialogue is to stay out of the conversation as much as possible. Let the two of you hash things out. If I need, if I feel a need to come in and kind of move things along or whatever, then, then I will. But otherwise I'll, I'll try to stay out as much as possible. We're going to do this for about 60 minutes. We'll turn to Q and a after that. So whoever would like to begin, feel free to start the conversation. Yeah. I would like yeah. to ask Chris to clarify. Um, Cause I didn't quite pick it up. Um, if all tongues is uh, human languages, what is the purpose of the gift? Why did God bestow it? And why did he say that this was a gift that could be edifying to people in the local church? What is its purpose, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my understanding, and it is somewhat speculation based on, you know, extrapolating from Paul saying that it's a sign for unbelievers. Its purpose, as I understand it, is to um, establish the um, truthfulness of what people are praying or praising God about in a language that they couldn't have, or at least there's every reason to think they couldn't have learned by natural means. It's to authorize that, to, to uh, legitimize it in the ears of people who do speak that particular language. Um, I think that it's that or, or a combination of that and for others who do understand the language but reject it, uh, like the Jews, some of those Jewish unbelievers in Acts 2 who think that the people are drunk and they reject it, um, they understand what's said, but they reject it anyway, and it's a sign for them of impending judgment. I think that's more or less what I would say. Yeah, the whole question of why they responded the way they did, um, you know, it's entirely possible, as several commentaries have pointed out, that they are being sarcastic. They're not actually accusing these people of being inebriated. Um, maybe they are mistaking their joy and their exuberance for inebriation. Um, but And furthermore, not everybody present was going to understand every language that was being spoken. They would only understand the language that was spoken um, that, uh, that they themselves speak. Um, I agree that... Um, Tongues are a sign for unbelievers, but a sign of what? Um, I understand the word sign there to simply mean um, an indication of God's attitude. Well, an attitude of what? And I think he's saying, based on his citation of Isaiah, that it's an attitude of judgment. Tongues are a negative sign um, to unbelievers, and you don't want to give them that sign. Therefore, don't speak in uninterpret uninterpreted tongues in uh, the corporate assembly when unbelievers can wander in off the street. Um, but furthermore, even after we acknowledge that tongues can function as a sign of judgment um, for unbelievers, uh, we don't want to reduce it to that. The error of reductionism is taking one purpose and saying it's the only purpose. Uh, 
But Paul very clearly says that uh, he prays in tongues, he sings in the Spirit, he gives praise in tongues. In verse 16 of chapter 14, he gives thanksgiving in tongues. So prayer, praise, and thanksgiving on the part of the believer to God uh, are also very much um, a purpose of, of the gift. Sure. Um, so I agree. And in fact, I think the text in Acts 2 indicates that what the people gathered to hear the disciples speak, heard the disciples speaking in tongues, was at least praise. They were extolling the works of God. Mm -hmm. So so praising God um, is still consistent with the tongues functioning as a sign to unbelievers that are present. Where I And I agree with you, by the way, that um, we can't, we shouldn't be reductionistic. My, my concern with your um, your description there, though, is that Paul says tongues are a sign for unbelievers in the very context in which he's talking about tongues that you understand to be some heavenly or angelic prayer language. So it's not like Acts says tongues are a sign to unbelievers, whereas Paul talks about it, a different expression of tongues where he doesn't call it a sign of unbelievers. No, he says that expression of tongue speech is a sign for unbelievers. And what I would argue is that um, and I'm interested to know what you make of this argument that I offered. And you're right, I spoke very fast. Um, and for that, I apologize. But um, as what I argued in my opening was that uh, the angelic heavenly prayer language reading, the glossolalia uh, idea, can't function as that kind of sign to unbelievers, because there's no way for unbelievers to discern it from the myriad frauds that occur all around the world every day when it comes to glossolalia. Um, so I'm curious to know, how would you, how, how do you think that, uh, or, or would you say that the understanding of tongues that you think is that Paul is largely talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, that that isn't a sign? Or would you say that that too is a sign? And if you do, how could it function as a sign to unbelievers if unbelievers have every reason to think that it's a, a fake? I'm not so sure that, I, I don't know anything in the text that would lead me to conclude they're saying it was a fake. Um, the point of the text, and especially citing Isaiah 28 is, God says, when I send a people to you speaking a language you can't understand, it's an indication of my displeasure and of my, and of, and of my judgment against you. And I think that would make perfectly good sense if um, um, anybody stood up in the, in the corporate gathering in Corinth or Ephesus or wherever else, and they spoke uh, in their heavenly language and unbelievers were present, uh, they would be confused. They would be... Um, bewildered. Uh, they would not hear anything intelligible that would lead them to faith in Christ, and it would serve in God's purpose as a sign of judgment against them. And I think what Paul is saying is, I don't want you to do that. That's why he says, therefore, don't speak in uninterpreted tongues in the presence of unbelievers. Uh, that's why he insists on interpretation in the corporate assembly. Um, also, well, if, let me just say one other quick thing, and then I'll stop. Um, if tongues are always a sign for unbelievers. Why is it that in two of the three instances of tongues in the book of Acts, unbelievers aren't present? They're only present in Acts 2. They're not present in Acts 10 and Acts 19. So I don't know how, uh, why would God in, enable these people to speak in tongues as a sign for unbelievers when there are no unbelievers present? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, and I already answered that in my rebuttal, um, or at least offered what I think is a good answer to that. And that is, look, take um, a shovel. A shovel has a particular purpose. It's it's meant to dig. But that doesn't mean that I can't use that shovel for some other purposes as well on occasion, like to, um, as a lever to lift some kind of heavy object or something. Well, in the same way, if Zeno, sorry, if gifted tongue speech is always human languages and is meant to be a sign for unbelievers, that wouldn't prevent the occasional occurrence of gifted tongue speech to serve some other purpose. And in the case of those other places in Acts, I think it's serving the purpose of communicating the reality that the gospel of the kingdom of God is going out to a larger and larger, more inclusive audience. Um, I'd agree with that. Certainly I, I, I don't disagree with that. Okay. So, so I don't, so anyway, hopefully that that's enough on that particular point, but going back to the point I was trying to make, I agree with you. I wasn't trying to make the argument that the text anywhere says that people think that the tongue speech is fake. What I'm saying is signs are intended to communicate 
a higher meaning. I, I, I know you agree with that. Um, and with with miracles, with miraculous spiritual gift type signs, the 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 miraculous nature of what's going on is what communicates, or or the unexpected nature of what's going on, um, is uh, what is allowing it to function as a sign. And what I'm saying is that given the ubiquitous nature of glossolalia or or glossolalia like. Uh, speech all throughout the world in false religions and cults uh, by drug users, by people that are suffering psychoses, given how indistinguishable all of that is from what a charismatic does on any given day, how, how could, how could that serve as a sign to unbelievers at all? What, what possible reason would they have for thinking that some higher message is being communicated by what's going on? Well, the point I think of Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 is they don't understand what's going on precisely because it's uninterpreted. That's why he insists on interpretation. It functions as a sign when it is interpreted. Um, but furthermore, um, you know, th this idea that um, there can be fake tongues in cults and non-Christian religions and so on, everything in Christianity can be faked by non-believers. Everything in Christianity can be um, twisted, distorted, and used for nefarious purposes, whether by those in cults or elsewhere. But to me, that's hardly an argument for why we should reject what Paul seems to be saying about the nature of tongues when used by Christians, which is prayer, praise, and thanksgiving to God. It's not communication uh, to individuals. It's rather prayer and praise to God himself. So the fact that things can be fabricated or distorted by non-Christians or cultists, uh, to me, is, an, is entirely irrelevant because everything can. Um, and it, in fact, everything pretty much is. We see it on a regular basis. Okay. So, uh, I don't think that... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. And, and again, oh. getting back to your, your shovel uh, analogy, I agree. That, that's my whole point, is that there are a multiplicity of purposes of tongues. Um, I think one of them is to deepen the communion of a believer with God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 that the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, and there's no indication that, uh, that that is sinful or wrong or unduly selfish. It's just not the ultimate purpose of tongues, um, but it is uh, one um, inevitable fruit of it. It's uh, an expression of praise. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how that benefits um, I don't know how, if, if all this is always, uh, we always insist this has to be in a language not bef learned before by the individual, how, I don't know how it can be uh, legitimate praise or prayer or thanksgiving, but if I have the confidence that the Spirit of God has crafted in linguistic form my prayers in my tongue, then I can know that my requests are being articulated to the Father in a clear and, and understandable way, and that my gratitude, Paul says, you know, in, in, first, in 16, 14, 16, that um, you're giving thanks well enough, but if it's not interpreted, the unbeliever can't say, or the person who comes in can't say amen to what you have just said. So it just strikes me as odd that all of these references to prayer, praise, and thanksgiving uh, would be in a human language that just seems to again run counter to verse two. Um, now, let me say this: Can okay. tongue speech today be xenolalia? Absolutely. So, yeah, I agree with you that I think again that's one of the many species of tongues. I think they're. I've talked with people in uh, who have experienced that very thing, especially people on the mission field. So. Yeah, I would agree with you. It, it certainly can be. I would just expand the range of the species of tongues to include glossolalia. I, I'm not excluding xenolalia by any means. I know you're not, and I, and I appreciate that. Uh, and I also appreciate, by the way, that you acknowledge that what's going on in Acts 2 is xenolalia and not some sort of hearing mm -hmm. gift by which glossolalia is correctly interpreted. Uh, I don't agree with you, though, that that Acts or that 1 Corinthians 14 lends itself more naturally to the glossolalia reading. I read it, and it's like, uh, it strikes me as xenolalia, even despite the fact that the person speaking it is praying or praising, because again, that's exactly what happens in Acts 2. See, I'm I'm not saying that the person who hasn't learned the language doesn't know what he's saying. In fact, I think that's a really bad misreading of what Paul says when he says that my 
mind or my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Okay. And so, we can get to that say, at some point if you'd like. Say that again. Could you say that again? I that said, last I'm not making the case. Yeah, I, I'm not making I'm not arguing that the person who's doing the tongue speaking doesn't understand what he's saying. Quite the opposite. I think they do. So the fact that they are praying, that they are giving thanks to God in a language they understand, or, or the fact that they're doing that doesn't seem to work against the Xenolalia reading for me, given that that's what exactly they're doing in Acts 2. They're extolling the works of God. There's every reason to think that they were praising God, just like what happens in 1 Corinthians 14. But I want to I want to turn to a different point. Um, you, you rebutted my case by pointing out that if tongues are always a human language, then while I'm speaking in the congregation, any, any number of people, especially in a multilingual first century Corinth, could get up and say, oh, I understood what you just said. Well, I want to read you something, and, and I want to know if you agree with this. Um, this is from an author who writes, most local churches in the first century were comparatively small. They met in homes. They rarely exceeded 150 people. And it would be quite the norm for virtually all people to know everyone else who was a member of that particular congregation. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I wrote it. You did. Okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> you did. Uh, so, so it seems to me that Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about the normative local congregational experience. And here in your book, you're describing the normative first century local church gathering experience in which virtually everybody knows virtually everybody there. And so, yes, there's a m big difference between me going up and speaking Japanese in front of my congregation, knowing they're not going to understand, versus somebody going up in first Corinth in in a Corinthian church and speaking a language when people there are m very multilingual. But if what you're saying is true, wouldn't we have at least some reason to believe that somebody standing up in the church at Corinth would know what what the multilingual status is of the various people and know whether there'd be anybody present to understand the language that he is planning on speaking? Well, yeah, but that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about unbelievers from outside the local church in Corinth entering into their midst. He's not talking about how the people in the church itself would understand it. Yeah, I agree with you there, but but the point is the normative experience is that I shouldn't speak in a language that my hearers won't understand, and I'll probably know beforehand that they won't understand it because I know who the people are in the congregations. The real question is what about the occasional occurrence on which an unbeliever enters? Well, again, even though, even though Corinth would have been very multilingual, I, it still seems to me that we have reason to think that an unbeliever who is going to enter is likely familiar or not familiar with a, a certain subset of languages common to the people in that particular area. In other words, if, if I'm, okay, let me put it this way. If I'm speaking, if I'm tempted to get up and speak in a language that I know nobody in my local congregation knows, because I because I know who they are, and if they are a decent representative sampling of the larger geographical area, wouldn't I have reason to also suspect that an unbeliever with whom I'm not familiar, who comes in, would probably be of a similar demographic categorization as the people in my congregation, and so couldn't I make the reasonable inference that they probably won't understand either? I have no way of knowing. That's so speculative. Okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any way of answering. Let me let me respond to one thing you said because maybe I misunderstood you. Are you sure. saying? I, I think you said it several times. Are you saying that any time an individual, let's just say in the context of First Corinthians fourteen, first century Corinth, stood up and spoke in tongues, that they understood what they were saying? I see no evidence for thinking that they didn't. Okay, why then would Paul say in verse 13, let the one who pray, speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret? Why would he have to pray that he may interpret? He already knows what he's saying. Yeah, that's just not true. Any, I, I, the way I put it in my rebuttal, and I didn't mean to be offensive, um, and so if I came across it way, I apologize. But the way I put it was, anybody who has studied multiple languages knows that it is extremely difficult to translate from a source language into another, even if you know both of those languages. And that challenge becomes even all the more difficult when you're dealing with pious speech, religious speech, speech riddled with idioms and figures of speech, and so on and so forth, metaphors imagery. So I don't agree with you. In fact, in, my, in that sermon that you watched a clip of, I told my congregation a very short Japanese proverb, um, and I told them the literal translation of it. 
And it still didn't make sense until I went through multiple layers of smoothing out the translation of the idiom before it became intelligible to the hearers. That's a difficult process. So I think that even if you do understand what you're saying in a, in a gifted tongue, you're understanding it in this in that language and translating that meaningfully to your audience in their destination language is not going to be an easy fa uh, easy thing to accomplish. So I think praying for the ability to translate it makes perfect sense. So what exactly is Paul telling the tongue speaker to do when he says, pray that you may interpret? What's, what's he actually telling them to do? I think he's telling the tongues or the would-be tongue speaker to pray for the ability to translate the what what he is saying and and in fact i think that word very but often he, makes perfect sense of, the, of translation but he already has the ability to translate no, it, you've acknowledged that he understands what it means in the language in which he spoke it right so he understands precisely what he's saying in this foreign language so why would he i don't understand how the gift of interpretation then would even be necessary because again, translating from one language to another meaningfully and with all of the very and, and with all the difficulties that especially come along with translating religious speech is very difficult, even if you know what you're saying in the source language. So yeah, here, here's, here's sure a similar example. Okay, that's fine. I do agree with that. And I think mm -hmm. that anybody that has struggled to translate something in one language into another, I think we'll immediately agree with what I'm saying here, but that's okay. We can disagree on that point. Well, again, I understand the interpretation simply to be the rendering in the vernacular of a speech that otherwise would not be intelligible. I don't think it, it means, you know, unpacking, explaining, applying as, as if as the sort of thing that we do in uh, a sermon, for example. No, I, I agree with you, but but even but as any translator of the biblical languages into a, an English translation will tell you, um, all translation is to some degree interpretation, um, sure, unless I agree. even the most wooden. Okay, so so even if you're not. Uh, expositing, you know, what it is you're saying, there is still work that goes into challenging work that goes into meaningfully translating what you're saying in one language into a destination language. And that gets all the more difficult with the more words that you're saying and the more nuance and, and all sorts of figures of speech and stuff that go into it. I see Cameron coming I... in. I think he probably wants to. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question uh, for, for either of you. Is, is there a word? So could Paul have said, uh, use the word translate instead of interpret there? Is there, is there a Greek word for the term translate? Do you know that off the top of your head, Dr. Sorens? Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with one if there is. And so, yeah. you know, some, some translation, some English versions actually use the word translate. Um, but I'm not, I don't think there's an, if there's another Greek term for it, I'm not familiar with it. So the, the word for whatever it's worth, the word is dia, um, dia re man, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it's the same word that's used in Acts 936, where Luke says there was in Joppa, a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. So what I would suggest is that this word interpret probably just is the same word that would be used to describe translation. Probably so. And then the gift, the, and then the gift the is the gift of translation. Then or interpretation would be the ability to to do it well, to to translate well or accurately, to, or to translate to translate meaningfully. Yeah. Um, so, for example, when I gave that, I'm trying to remember back at that sermon I gave a few months ago, but I I gave a Japanese idiom, very short one, which literally translated is something like monkeys and trees to fall. Now that's a translation of that idiom that I that, that I gave in Japanese. But nobody in, nobody has any earthly idea what that means until I translate it meaningfully into even monkeys fall from trees. <laughs> 
So what I'm saying is that the gift, in my belief, the gift of interpretation is the gift of being able to meaningfully translate what is said in a language you didn't already, you weren't already familiar with. So you're gifted with the meaningful translation of the language you're not already familiar with into a destination language. <clears throat> is that, would you say that, is that like a spiritual gift or could someone just do that just without being... All the spiritual gifts, or at least many of them, are gifts for which there are naturalistic counterparts. Um, the gift of helps, the gift of administration, the gift of mercy, the gift of faith, all spiritual gifts um, can be accomplished naturally. They just appear to be miraculously gifted to people, not accumulated through normative means. Yeah, and I, I'd just say we've probably beaten this one until it's black and blue, but I would just simply say that I think verse 13 of chapter 14, Paul is saying, look, if you're going to pray in the corporate assembly of the church, ask the Spirit of God to grant you the gift of interpretation because you don't know what you're saying, and without the interpretation, neither will the people who are listening to you. That seems to me to be the most reasonable reading of that verse. I understand. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, the verse in which Paul says that the tongue speaker, if he can't interpret or if there's no one to interpret, should speak to himself. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I understand that, oh, I, let me let me rephrase that. I suspect that what you, what you would argue is that he's just setting up a contrast between speaking in tongues at church versus speaking in tongues privately, and that this idea of privately is what is meant by speak to himself. Now, if I'm right about that, can you point me to any evidence, any example in which um, somebody speaks to him or herself and doesn't understand what he's saying? Well, you are, you're taking that reference, which has specifically uh, the focus on tongues, and then you're comparing it to numerous other places where tongues is not even involved and where obviously everyone would assume that speaking to yourself or to someone else is intelligible. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about unintelligible tongues, which Paul prohibits in the church, because that's why he says you have to have interpretation. And it seems to me that the contrast is pretty clear. Let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So um, again, it, maybe it's not as explicit as we would want it to be, but it seems to me, given what Paul said earlier in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, what he says also in verses 18 and 19, that he has in view uh, his private expression of prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, uh, not in the context of the local church, but in the privacy of his own devotional life. Okay, so just to make sure I understand, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you would say is, number one, the only other places where somebody, laleo, speaks to him or herself it's always elsewhere understood by the person speaking. And even though everywhere else that somebody laleo speaks to a, a, a hearer, the hearer understands, even though that's true of everywhere else except for 1 Corinthians 14, because of your interpretation of 1 Corinthians 14 as referring to unintelligible speech, therefore to himself must just mean privately. Is that, in other words, in other words, all of that other linguistic evidence just doesn't bear on the question? It doesn't bear on the question because it's two entirely different subjects. First Corinthians 14 is the only place where Paul talks about speaking to oneself in tongues. Uh, in all those other places, he's talking about speaking in the vernacular that he understands, that everybody listening to him understands. So you're comparing apples and oranges. I don't think you can read or try to interpret first Corinthians 14 28 in, in light of all of these other references because they have nothing to do whatsoever with the gift of tongues right but they do use the same verb la o and they both use a date of case recipient and you're just saying that that's not enough right definitely not enough given the fact that contexts are so radically different okay um, do you mind if I, 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 I was one of the last, last question. Do you have one for me? I, I don't want to monopolize our time. I actually no, wanted to give, no. I wanted to give Sam the opportunity. Is it, would this be a good time to take a break? Um, I'm okay. Let's, let's press on a little farther. And if we need to, um, I'll give you an alert. Okay. Unless Chris wants to take a break. No, no, no. I'm good. <laughs> I appreciate okay. that though. Um, well, if you don't have another question for me, I, I want to ask you about 
my argument concerning Acts 2. So the way that you rebutted the argument and the way that you rebutted in the book is you say it's an unjustified assumption that if Acts 2 is describing xenolalia as the gift of tongues, that therefore that must be what the gift of tongues always is. And I, and I would agree with you, that, is a, a, that isn't good hermeneutics. But the argument that I made was a, was more nuanced than that, more substantive, I think, than that. The argument that I made was that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul's, wrote the book of Acts after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and that Luke spent plenty of time with Paul after writing 1 Corinthians, such that he was familiar with Paul's experiences in theology, so much so that Dr. Craig Keener says that there are numerous correspondences between Acts and Paul, indicating that Luke was very familiar with Paul. And then I said, with all of that in mind, with the fact that Luke would have already spent so much time with Paul and been familiar with much of Paul's experiences in theology, I then point out the numerous similarities between what Luke describes in Acts, which he wrote after his time with Paul, the similarities between that passage in, in Acts 2 and uh, Paul's in 1 Corinthians 14. So how do you how do you respond to that more fleshed out argument that Acts 2 mm. tells us 1 Corinthians 14 is xenolalia? It's a very good point. I just don't think it's persu persuasive. Um, I because I think you know, you can um, you can look at all the parallels and the chronological sequence in which these books were written. And obviously, yes, Luke and Paul were uh, companions. But the fact of the matter is, given differing contexts, they use language in differing ways. So, for example, um, it's we have even within the New Testament itself, we have the word sanctification uh, used repeatedly, but we, it's used in two or three differing ways. Sometimes it refers to definitive consecration. Other times it refers to progressive transformation. Uh, it's either objective and it's a status or it's subjective and it's an experience. But you have to look at the individual context in which those words appear um, to make a decision on how the term is being used. And I think that's the same thing here. You know, there was probably, I'm going to say, what, First Corinthians written, what, about 55, 56, and Acts written anywhere from as early as 62 to as late as the 70s. So there's a upwards of conceivably a decade or two between the two. And language oftentimes um, can be used in differing ways over time, giving different contexts. So I don't, I don't necessarily see that, that there's a, a, an airtight argument that simply because Luke and Paul knew each other, they had to use the same terminology in the same way. Um, so again, I, right off the top of my head, I can't think of examples, but if I had time, my guess is we could find, uh, well, let me think of one. Um, although I'm not entirely convinced of this, you probably are aware of the fact that many charismatics and Pentecostals argue that Luke uh, understands the reception of the Spirit uh, differently from Paul, that Paul associated spirit baptism with conversion, Luke with subsequent power encounters throughout the course of a Christian life. Now, whether or not that can be substantiated, uh, it does appear that they have different emphases. Luke does not emphasize um, the, the reception of the spirit as simultaneous with conversion in every case. Paul seemingly does in light of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. So um, I acknowledge the you know the obviously the the close connection between the two um and even i might even say that the weight of evidence is on your side there unless i have good contextual reasons for questioning that which i think i do when i read first corinthians 14. i just see it as so functioning in such a different way from acts 2 that it just seems obvious to me that they're using the same word but in different contexts to describe different expressions of tongues Okay. Um, a question then about church history. Um, I made the argument in my last minute, I was speaking particularly fast in the last minute of my opening because mm -hmm. I was so close to running out of time, but I, I cited Irenaeus and Origen and Ephraim the Syrian and the Apostolic Constitutions and Chrysostom and Augustine and Cyril of Alexandria, all mm -hmm. indicating that they believed that the gift of tongues Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 14 is the gift of speaking human languages. Would, would you dispute any of those individuals I mentioned? 
I'm not, I haven't looked at those quotes, so I'm, I can't even speak intelligibly into that. You may be right, um, but there were a lot of things, obviously, that the early church fathers believed that I don't believe today and can't be substantiated from Scripture. Um, so I would have to go back and look. I, You know, the, the study that I have done in the patristic period uh, was in response to cessationists who right. argued yeah. that uh, all uh, the gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 um, or somehow had died out after the death of the Apostle John. And, of course, we have dozens of explicit statements uh, very much to the contrary. But I have not looked specifically at what they said about tongues. So, I mean, I'll take your word for it. You've done the study. I'm not disputing it. I'm just saying I can't really speak to that without having, without looking at to see if maybe there are some counterexamples. Maybe there were other fathers um, and apologists who had, a, who had a, a view of glossolalia. I just don't know. I'm not. I'm not well versed in that particular issue. I'm not very either, and I'd like to become so over time. Um, but what about the rest of church history? I mean, are you aware of any, um, you know, respected Christian writers from prior to say 1800 that that really clearly identify the gift of tongue speech in First Corinthians 14 as an angelic or heavenly prayer language that humans don't understand ordinarily? Not off the top mm -hmm. of my head. Uh, so okay. I'm not aware. I know that um, I know that there's evidence that the Moravians spoke in tongues, uh, that it was uh, present in the uh, uh, in the Wesleyan revival. But I'm I don't have any concrete evidence of, as to what they specifically understood to be going on, whether xenolalia or glossolalia. I don't know. It's my understanding that the early sort of the founders of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements, they actually initially thought the gift of tongues was xenolalia, and it wasn't until some time later that the charismatic and or Pentecostal movements started changing to thinking that it's glossolalia. Do you is that your understanding as well, or, or is it just not something you're at all familiar with? Uh, the only thing I am familiar with, I know that uh, what at when. Uh, was it Agnes Osman in Topeka, uh, Kansas, uh, which was supposedly the first expression of this, which it first broke out and then eventually led to Azusa Street. But she supposedly was believed to have uh, spoken in Chinese or Mandarin. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's the only instance that I know of where we could reasonably conclude that they believed it was uh, Xenolalia, but I'm not familiar with, I'm not familiar with enough of the history there to be able to speak to it intelligibly. Okay. Um, one last question, and then maybe Cam can ask some if you don't have any by that point. Um, so put yourself in my shoes, um, and I look at the uses of the verb laleo everywhere else in the New Testament and where speaking to oneself happens, and I see unanimously that the one being spoken to, whether it's somebody else or oneself, understands what is said. Um, and then I see that um, Paul was Luke's or Luke was Paul's companion, was very familiar with Paul's experiences in theology by the time he wrote Acts, and then writes identically of xenolalia as Paul describes glossolalia. And then thirdly, I look at church history and I see all the way in centuries and centuries and centuries ago, Christians understanding the gift of 1 Corinthians 14 as xenolalia and not seeing this, the glossolalia understanding crop up until about 200 years ago. If that's the position that you found yourself in, and then you didn't see any evidence from 1 Corinthians 14 that would suggest that it's a heavenly or angelic language that is ordinarily unintelligible to human beings, would you find yourself agreeing with me at that point? In other words, do you would your response be yeah but the the fourth i just can't make sense of first corinthians 14 as xenolalia so i'm forced to overlook those considerations and read it in the way that i do yes the latter let me ask you a quick question you said yeah. something that i'm a little confused by so you say in verse uh, 28 let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. And you're saying that absolutely has to mean that he understands what he's saying to himself. If that's the case, why is the prohibition on his speaking in the corporate assembly? Why should he keep silent? If he understands what he's saying, why doesn't he go ahead and speak it and, um, and communicate those truths to the people who are present? Because, because in the situation envisioned, only the would-be tongue speaker understands the language, what, what he's saying in that language. 
So we've already covered this earlier. Um, my belief, my understanding, and this is by no means mine alone, lots and lots of Christians who take my reading of this passage feel the same way, that what is going on, or, or that translating what you understand to be saying in one language into a destination language can be very difficult, extremely challenging. So if you're, so what I think Paul is saying is, if you're, um, if you're given a, a, a prayer or, or praise in a language that you know nobody else understands in the congregation, then keep silent and just pray to yourself in the congregation. Because if you don't, then you're, uh, the people around you won't be able to make sense of what you're saying. That but if you be... understand, let's see, but if you understand what you're saying, why can't you make sense for the people and say, here, this is what I'm saying, and this is what it means. I don't understand because... why that would be prohibited. Because translation is extremely difficult, and just because you can woodenly translate word for word what you say, if in fact you can, doesn't mean that you're going to be able to have it edifying to the people you're speaking to, which is, of course, Paul's whole point throughout the, the message. You, 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 don't, you only speak it to yourself if you can't make meaning, if you can't meaningfully deliver the message that you're saying in one tongue into the tongue that the, your hearers understand. And I guess I just don't buy into the argument that a person who understands what they're saying couldn't do that. It seems to me that you're complicating this whole issue of, uh, of, of interpretation or translation in a way that isn't necessary. If, if I'm speaking in a, you know, if I, if I'm speaking in Spanish, for example, and um, there's nobody else in my congregation who understands Spanish, um, I think I could probably fairly reasonably say after I spoke the word in Spanish, folks, here's what I mean. Here's what I just said. And I think they could understand that. I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the difficulty there that you seem to be portraying. Now, granted, you know, your example of monkeys falling from trees is one thing, but um, I just don't think that all language is necessarily that complicated, um, especially on the part of a person who understands perfectly well what they are saying in one, I think they ought to be able um, to be able to communicate that in the vernacular language so that other people could understand. And if that's the case, I just don't well, understand why Paul would prohibit them from, from doing that in the corporate assembly. Well, I'll just quote um, David Crystal and his entry in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Language from 1989. And what David Crystal in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Language says is there is no task more complex than translation. Translators not only need to know their source language well, they must also have a thorough understanding of the field of knowledge covered by the source text and of any social, cultural, or emotional connotations that need to be specified in the target language if the intended effect is to be conveyed. The same special awareness needs to be present for the target language so that points of special phrasing, contemporary fashions of taboos and expressions, local or regional expectation, and so on can all be taken into account. Also, Bob Zerhusen, um, in his Biblical Theology Bulletin article on the problem tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, um, says that translation involves the kinds of factors that Crystal refers to here, and so it makes sense that Paul would tell the language speaker to ask God for help in translating into Greek. That just makes perfect sense to me, and I'm not going to argue with an expert linguist like uh, David Crystal. Well, I'm not an expert linguist. Um, what he's describing, perhaps in the contemporary scene, it seems to me in li all likelihood is different from what Paul is describing in first century Corinth or in Ephesus or Colossae or wherever else tongue speakers might uh, want to communicate in church. But I'll leave it at that. I don't think so I have any one, other questions. Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. One thing I was going to get in, Chris, just let me know if you've already addressed this or talked about it, but one of the points that Sam brought up in his I think it was his opening statement was the fact that if <clears throat> your view is correct, Chris, then that would mean that millions of Christians are just engaging in like, you know, uh, some, some really wacky <laughs> practices to put it lightly. So uh, what is your take on that sort of objection? I, and I don't think that Sam was saying that this is some kind of like knockdown argument mm, against sure. the, no, the view, but, but I would, I would like to kind of get some of your thoughts on that. 
millions of Christians now and through history have been wrong about all sorts of things. The Reformation is proof of that. Even to, you know, to this day, there are millions of us Christians who are young earth creationists that those of you who are not would think are crazy. There are um, millions of us Christians who are amillennialists and preterists or partial preterists to use the unfortunate language, who many of you dispensationalists, premillennialists and historic premillennialists and even post-millennialists post -millennialists would think are insane. And on and on I could go. Um, all through church history, large numbers of Christians have been wrong about certain things. And that I don't know what to say about that other than so what? You know, we are humans. Uh, we still wrestle with a sin nature. We, we, we still struggle not to read into the text of Scripture our own presuppositions and biases and experiences and so forth. And so all of us are going to be wrong about many things in our faith. And I just don't see that as particularly problematic so long as the thing about which we're wrong is not an essential of the faith. And that's why I wholeheartedly disagree with people like John MacArthur in Strange Fire, who seems to suggest that anybody who thinks like Dr. Storms does on this topic is a heretic. I think that's tragic that anybody would make that kind of claim. So yeah, I, I just say, so what? Yeah, lots of people are wrong, as I'm sure I am on a number of topics. I do Any have one same? question. Uh, no, I, I, I agree with that. We're, you know, lots of people is one thing, several hundred million is another. And again, I'm not saying that's why I believe what I do about 1 Corinthians 14. I'm just simply saying that oftentimes uh, common experience does serve a confirming function uh, or a, dis, um, a disconfirming function, conversely, one or the other. But again, I, I would never uh, base my argument on that particular point. It's just an interesting observation that I thought would be helpful for us to address. I, again, I'm wondering, um, I don't know, Chris, if you address this, but what your understanding of 1 Corinthians 14, 5 is. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. What, I'm just wondering, if Paul is talking there about uninterpreted tongues in the privacy of devotion, which he is because he says, unless there's an interpretation, you can't do it in church, um, why would he recommend and want everybody to do that um, if in fact they already perfectly understand what they're saying, what's the point? What's the point of the, of the, of the glossa? Yeah. So I actually don't agree with you that Paul is talking about tongues in a private setting. In fact, I think that that is a, an interpretation of what Paul says when he says to do it, to, to not to do it in church or to be silent in church, but to speak to himself and to God. I don't think that he's saying speak in church or at home, do this other thing. I think he's saying at church, if people don't understand you and you can't interpret and there's nobody to interpret, then speak silently to yourself and to God in church. So I don't agree that he's talking about a private devotional setting. I, so I don't, I don't share, I don't buy that premise to begin with. But setting that aside, I think that the ability, the gift of speaking in languages that you have not already learned would be a huge blessing to any Christian anywhere he or she might find himself. Um, not because it will enable him to pray or praise God with, with with meaning they wouldn't have ordinarily been able to do in their language they are familiar with, but because that gift would enable them to um, be the kind of uh, to, to, to behave with the kind of signed unbelievers that tongues is meant to be. Um, and so they might even be able to uh, change hearts and minds the way that the tongue speakers in Acts 2 did for many of the people around. Yeah, I guess I struggle with that reading of verse 5 because Paul says, I want you all to speak in tongues. Well, he obviously means uninterpreted tongues because he then Why? goes on to, because he goes on to say, um, unless someone interprets so that because he's he prohibits uninterpreted tongues in the corporate assembly. So how can he say, I want you all to speak in tongues, but you can't do it in the assembly because there's no interpretation. Oh, so where I does understand. it take place? I don't. Yeah, I just I don't think he's saying I want you all to speak in tongues in the local congregation. I think he narrows his focus on what's going on in the, in the local indication or the local congregation thereafter. But let's say hypothetically speaking, that I granted that he was saying in the local congregation, I want you all to speak in tongues. Well, then presumably he would also want for them to be able to all no. interpret or at least. That's not what I'm saying. Speak. 
Okay. I apologize for misunderstanding. No, no, no. I don't think he's saying, I want you all to speak in tongues in the corporate assembly. He's saying, oh, yeah, I, I, don't know. I think, I think he's referring to the same phenomenon that he does down in verse 18, when he talks about his own gift of tongues, that is more frequent and fervent than all the ha tongue happy Corinthians combined. Um, I think he's saying in the corporate assembly, you have to have interpretation or keep your mouth shut. But that doesn't rule out the fact that he prayed in tongues fervently in private. And that I think that's what he's recommending or wishing would the case in first Corinthians 14, five, because largely if, if in fact, which by the way, it's interesting, it does mean that not all in Corinth were speaking in tongues, um, which, you know, refutes some of the, the classical Pentecostal views. Um, but yeah. furthermore, it, it would have, it would have solved the problems in Corinth because the tongue speaker, as you know, were, looking down their noses at the non-tongue speaker thinking you don't have the spirit fullness of the spirit. Um, and Paul says, boy, it would really be great and solve all our problems if all of you had the gift, but in fact, not all had the gift. So that's how I'm understanding that. Uh, well, that's, that verse. that's a better answer to your own question than even I answered that the reason he would want them all to speak in tongues is so they no longer see it as a cause for division. Um, but, but uh, so I, I, I agree with you that Paul is not ask, is not expressing his desire that all of the Corinthians speak in the local congregation in tongues. I think he's talking about having the gift in general. And it's not true that the only two contexts um, in which one might plausibly speak in tongues are the local congregation or in the privacy of one own, one's own home. In fact, you've, you've now said again that he says he praise privately in his devotional time in tongues. The text doesn't say that. We don't have that. Uh, we, that's, a, that's an inference. And it might be the right one, but I don't infer it that way. And meanwhile, there are other mm -hmm. contexts for in which tongues are expressed, not at least the one in Acts 2. It's neither a local church congregational setting nor private devotional time. And yet the ability to speak in gifted tongues had a wonderful praiseworthy effect on many, many Jews gathered from around the known world who heard that and saw it as the sign it was intended to be and so converted. So I think that one possible answer to your question is that Paul wants them to be able to speak in tongues so that they're, they don't have this, this thing over which they divide because they're, it puffs them up. But another possible answer, and these aren't mutually exclusive, is that he wants them all to have this gift because of how it can be used in other contexts besides the local congregation. And of course, nowhere is that stated. That's pure speculation. Um, the reason why I don't... I Both of our views are speculating, but anyway, go ahead. I don't think you can appeal to Acts 2 as saying, oh, here's another context in which tongues can be used, because as I'm sure you will admit, Pentecost was a singular event in history, an unrepeatable outpouring of the Spirit of God. And it, therefore, the idea that it would be repeated over and over again, and people could use their gift of tongues in that same kind of way, is just simply not true. I think Pentecost was singular and, well, um, I, and unrepeatable. And let me, let me say one more thing first. Okay. One more thing real quick. Um, back down in verses 18 and 19. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind. So what's the alternative to in church? And given the way Paul describes tongues as prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, uh, it seems to me that he's talking about that which takes place privately, not in surrounded by anybody else, not in church right. or out on the road or anywhere else. He's talking about what happens in his prayer closet. I think he's pulling back the curtain as it were and saying, look, I want you to see what I do in my own private devotions with the Lord. I pray, I sing, I sing with my spirit. I praise God. I, um, I give thanks with my spirit, all of which I think is are expressions of tongue speech that take place in his private devotions. Right. So the, the idea that this is in his private devotions is every bit as much speculation, every bit as much inference on your part as the things that you've alleged are inference and speculation on my part. If Because again, 
there are the, the, the only two options are not in church and in private devotion. Even if you set Pentecost aside, there are all sorts of contexts in which you are neither in the local church gathering nor in your prayer closet. And there's nothing but inference and speculation that can get you to the idea that Paul is talking about the prayer closet and not one of the myriad other contexts in which one might plausibly exercise the gift. But as for your claim that Pentecost, I don't know what the I don't know what those myriad contexts are. I don't see any reference to them in the New Testament. Testament. Uh, there it's well number one it's just logical L logically there are more places you can be more contexts in which you find yourself than just the local church congregation and privately and paul so doesn't anywhere talk about the private prayer language or the private prayer context so you can't arbitrarily rule out the other myriad possible contexts in which the gift might be exercised but but let me let me get back to your point about acts 2 because it bears directly on this question i don't agree with you that that insofar as it relates to the point I'm trying to make, Pentecost can't be repeated. Sure, you can't have another singular event in history with the kind of uh, significance that Pentecost had, but can the Holy Spirit fall on people, even in possibly large numbers, even when there are possibly large numbers of people gathered to, to hear the tongues miraculously spoken when the Spirit falls upon them outside of a church gathering? Of course. And there are all sorts of cases in which that might have happened that aren't recorded in, in the New Testament. Um, and, and some which are, but maybe aren't, um, uh, there weren't unbelievers present like the ones in Acts 10 and Acts 19. So I do see Acts 2 as an example, but not the only conceivable one, of a context in which one might express the gift of tongues other than the local congregation and the private prayer closet, which, by the way, Paul does not explicitly mention. Not just the word closet, but the idea that it's done at home. That is entirely inference and speculation. Well, it's not just inference and speculation. It's a reasonable conclusion from the contrast with what he does in church and what he would permit in church or not permit. So I, I don't actually agree with you because when Paul says, for example, um, that in, you know, in church, I would rather you do all of this, even though I speak tongues more than all of you, that, that, that doesn't mean that what he's contrasting is being able to speak in all sorts of tongues in private versus doing it in church. He could just be saying that even though I have the ability to do to speak in tongues and I do so more often than any of you, in this one particular context, I would rather do prophecy. That wouldn't mean that he the only context that's the alternative would be private prayer closet. And in the other place where he says, uh, speak to himself and to God, uh, you know, in, in verse 20, um, 28, Thank you. 28, when he says, uh, if there's no one to interpret, let them each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. That in church doesn't, you can't assume that's only governing the part about keeping silent. It can also govern the speaking to himself and to God. In other words, the contrast is not in church versus private, or at least my reading of it is not that the contrast is between in church versus private. The contrast is what you do uh, in church when you can interpret versus what you do when you can't. Both are taking place in the church, though, on my reading. But Paul prohibits speaking in tongues in church without interpretation. So Unless you do it it, What? Unless you're so speaking words, silently to so, himself. Okay, so here's Paul at, at, at saying, all right, folks, look, if you want to speak in tongues, but there's no one there to interpret, um, ignore everything else that's going on around you. Don't pay attention to those prophesying. Don't pay attention to those interpreting tongues. Don't pay attention to teaching or the singing of hymns. Just kind of hunker down in your own mind and speak to yourself and to God um, with that oblivious to everything else that's happening in the local church. Um, I find that hard to believe. So, well, I do too, uh, but I don't think it's a fair characterization of what I've proposed. Um, I'm not proposing that somebody who's given a, a, a tongue that they could possibly, they could choose to speak or not, is given 15, 30, or 45 minutes of tongue speak that they then need to sit and silently pray to themselves. One might be given something in tongues that they could say in 15 seconds, and he's saying, don't get up and do it in front of the congregation, speak silently to, your, to yourself. And yeah, you might if, miss 15 seconds of what others in the congregation are doing. Let me ask you, is speaking to yourself a private affair? What do you mean by a private affair? Yes, only I am involved, but that doesn't mean but that I I'm you, But I thought you said that tongues is not designed for private prayer or praise or gratitude. And yet, isn't that precisely what Paul's recommending I there? I don't think that's what I said. I think what I said is there's no evidence in the text that Paul is saying you should do it in private. That's not the same well, thing as saying... But, what what does it mean? Don't do it 
where other people can hear you because there's no interpretation, rather speak to yourself and to God. If that isn't private, I don't know what is. Well, that's why I said it depends on what you mean by private. If I'm in a group, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm in an auditorium with 100 other congregants, and I suddenly have, you know, 15 seconds worth of prayer or praise that come to me in a, in a language nobody around me understands. Then Paul, I think, would tell me, don't stand up and speak this aloud and thereby confuse all the people around you who don't understand. Instead, just speak it to yourself. You've still got hundreds of people around you, which means you're not in private, but you're the only sure one in during vo- okay well fine but then it's still in private in the church setting and it's no longer a contrast between in church and in private <coughs> that's why uh, i said it depends on what you mean by private right if we're talking about being in private like in a private location i don't think that's what paul's talking about because he's talking about in the local church setting but yeah sure he says it's possible to to speak it silently to yourself using language that everywhere else suggests you understand uh but we're setting that aside um you can absolutely do that, and yet, and it can be private in the sense that you're talking about, even though you're surrounded by tons of people. And if you can do it there, why can't you do it at home? I'm not saying you can't. Okay. I'm just saying that's. Well, I thought you said. I thought you said. I thought you said you couldn't. I don't think I did, and if I did, it was a mistake. Mm-hmm. There, if mm-hmm. if somebody has the the gift of being able to speak xenolalia as I think the gift is, then one could do it in the presence of hundreds of people, some of whom are unbelievers, as in Acts 2. They could do it in a much more um, intimate setting, like in Acts 10 or Acts 19, where only a few people are present and they're all believers. It could be done in an intimate setting like a local church gathering, um, in which only believers are present. And it could be done in one's, in the, in one's private domicile without anybody present at all. I have no the problem same with that. The same could be true of glossolalia. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't made the argument that, that glossolalia in principle couldn't be done in all those places. What I've argued is that in none of those contexts could it function as a sign. Um, and you disagreed, and that's fine. I argued that no, no, church... No, 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 no. No, what Paul did in his private prayers or the person speaking to himself and to God, it's obviously not functioning as a sign there because nobody else can hear it. Right. But if you're in the company of unbelievers, my argument is that glossolalia couldn't function as a sign. And you don't agree with that argument, and that's fine. I mean, if, I asked you oh, earlier. To ask, say that. Say that again. If you are in the company of unbelievers, mm-hmm. and you speak aloud in glossolalia, a heavenly mm-hmm. or angelic prayer language, then it can't function as a sign to those unbelievers present. That was my argument. Oh yeah, and I, I think that's precisely what it can do. That's what Paul is saying that it can do, and that's why he recommends that you not pray in uninterpreted tongues when unbelievers have the potential for being present. Right, but it's actually that, the whole not- point is the whole point is they can't understand. That's the whole point of God's intention is that I'm going to do something through these people that is going to confuse you and confound you and put you under and basically cause you to walk away from the gospel altogether and thus come under my judgment that is the sign that the that the uninterpreted tongue is giving and that's why paul says don't speak in uninterpreted tongues when unbelievers come into the meeting because you don't want to give them that sign well and i agree with all of that except that i don't share your assumption or i should say your conclusion that the gift paul is talking about in first corinthians 14 that might go uh un understood not understood by unbelievers and therefore function as a sign is glossolalia i think xenolalia does the same thing if i get up in front of it let, oh, let's go I, back. I think it could i i it could i'm not ruling okay. out the possibility of xenolalia but i'm arguing that glossolalia could not i'm well, arguing yeah, that I, it, I would just disagree i think it I easily could I know. Uh, and my, uh, just to reiterate for those people watching, my argument was that given how ubiquitous, it's, it's, it's unlike any other kind of allegedly miracle, miraculous gift on the part of Christians. Um, everywhere in every culture, every, you know, all sorts of false religions, all sorts of pagan shamanistic cultures and new ages, uh, people that are on DMT and extreme hallucinogen, people that have psychoses, all sorts of people all around the world faking it. Some aren't, some people are, it's a neurological phenomenon, whatever, do something that is indiscernible from what I take you to be thinking that Christians do when they speak glossolalia. 
And as such, I don't know how an unbeliever could walk into a congregation and see people speaking in glossolalia and have that be a sign of anything, convey meaning to them, the, at least not the intended meaning. What it would in, what it would communicate to unbelievers is <laughs> these people that's, are are mad. That's, but that's precisely the point. It doesn't communicate meaning. That's why it's, it's an expression divine. of divine judgment. I actually think way, it does. Okay, sorry. I was, I was just saying, I'm sorry, uh, Cameron. Can we? This would be a good place for a little break. Can we do that? Yeah, let's do that. And uh, while you're taking your break, I'm actually gonna ask Chris a couple questions. So, uh, if if you're cool with, with hanging out with me, Chris. But yeah, for sure. All okay. right, I'll be back in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so Chris, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you related to this whole debate is like, what is your um, personal experience with tongues. Have you ever, like, did you ever at one point think that you had like the glossolalia or like the angelic, like, did, did you ever engage in that? Did you ever do that? Or have you always had the view that you have now? Uh, no, I've never had an experience, uh, or tried to have an experience of speaking glossolalia. Um, I don't think when I first became a Christian, I would have had a view of it one way or the other. I was familiar with the concept. I mean, everybody in secular culture is familiar with Christians, quote unquote, speaking in tongues. But I probably had the same negative association, even as a new believer, um, as an unbeliever would, with, as far as that seeming to make Christianity look foolish. And so I think I was probably already predisposed to accept the Xenolalia reading that I'm offering now, um, mm. which means, of course, that everything I'm saying, you got to take a big grain of salt with. But of course, you'd have to do that even if I, you know, even if that weren't well, the no, case. I, no, I, I don't, I don't interpret it that way at all. I just, I just uh, was curious, like what your background was and like why you came to the view that you came to, if there was some like, I don't know experience you had with it like because i mean i i came away I'm, I'm kind of agnostic on this whole question personally sure. but i mean i was part of a charismatic movement for my i mean growing up and and it, tongues was everywhere and so i eventually became skeptical of that but it, it, anyways i was just i was kind of curious about your well your let me background. let me answer a slightly a slightly modified question then if the question is why did i um, you know, why have I come to make this something of a topic that I want to be go out there and be speaking about mm -hmm. on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's because of what I argued in an episode of my show a number of months ago, which is that um, if glossolalia, if the glossolalia reading um, favored by charismatics and Pentecostals, if it is a mistaken reading, and if the xenolalia reading is right, then consider what the glossolalia reading is doing to the church and uh, how it's making the church look in the eyes of the world. And so I played clips, a variety of clips that showed that to the outside world, glossolalia makes Christianity look foolish. And because I don't think that glossolalia is the right reading of that text, I want to convince as many people as I can that that's not what Paul is saying, because I think that it will um, remove one obstacle in the eyes of some unbelievers for whom it's, for, for, who think that it's clearly evidence that Christianity is a bunch of baloney. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly, I, I agree that there is a lot of uh, uh, tongue speaking so-called in a lot of churches, especially in the charismatic world, uh, that are done improperly, that are done without interpretation. Uh, but again, I'd say there's just as big an offense to the truth of Christianity that comes from the teaching of cults or people that are teaching salvation by works or those that are um, uh, elevating Mary uh, to the, uh, sorry, Cameron, to bring that up, to the same level as <laughs> Jesus. Um but, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of uh, aberrations in non-Christian religions that uh, ought to be eliminated because of their offense and they're a stumbling block to people seeing the truth of Christianity. Um, let, me, let me ask a quick question. I don't think, Chris, that you have addressed it yet. I would like to, and I'm, and I'm not, this is not an argument. It's just a question for my own in, information. Sure. Um, Let me just say before you ask that, yeah. let's talk about this just for a couple minutes, and then we do need to turn to Q and A with the audience. Yeah. What What do you understand? Um, 
uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 to mean the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I think it's a bad thing. I, I, I take the reading that I'm sure you're well acquainted with that, that it's, it's, it's it's like sarcasm, right? It's it's like saying one one who speaks in a tongue elevates himself, but the one who speaks the one who prophesies elevates others. Okay, first of all, that's not what the word oiko demeo means. Oh, I know. It means build up strength. It doesn't mean elevate. You're in, you're infusing a definition onto a word that means the very opposite. It means to no, build no, no, up no. and strengthen. I was using the word elevate just as an analogy for how the word is being used, I think, sarcastically. Um, I, I would say so, it's builds up, I think, is, is being used sarcastically here to refer to pridefully elevating, pridefully making oneself look better in the eyes of others. So it's interesting that of the probably a couple of dozen references to that uh, uses of that word in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, that's the only place where suddenly it means something sarcastic and not sincere, something uh, negative instead of positive. I find that hard to believe. Furthermore, what do you do with uh, Jude 20? But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Same Greek verb. It's a positive thing. I, my, my assumption is everything we do is, is designed to build ourselves up. There's nothing selfish about it, only selfish if it becomes an end in itself. But if by building myself up, by reading scripture, by studying, by praying, by spending time with other Christians, I become better equipped to serve you and to edify you, it's a good thing. So I don't, I don't see anything in that text that suggests this is sarcasm. I think he's saying, look, this is a good thing. You are strengthened. Your intimacy with the Lord is deepened. Um, your uh, awareness of his presence and power is expanded. Um, so again, Paul doesn't, you know, people often to ask me to say, how does speaking in tongues in a private prayer life build you up? And I said, well, obviously Paul didn't think it was important enough to explain it or try to account for it. So I can't either. I don't know. I'm just confident that the word of God says it. So I'm going to believe it. Um, and I, again, there's just nothing in the text that suggests that he is, um, that, that he is somehow, uh, in, and somehow being um, a negative or sarcastic, especially given the fact that he turns right around in the next verse and says, and I want you all to speak in tongues. Why? Because it edifies you. Well, so, and that, that may be a good argument for this one particular point um, that I might very well concede at some point, because if what I'm saying is true, that the gifted tongue, tongue speaker is speaking a human language, and they do understand what they're saying, they just aren't able to translate it, um, that would, in fact, build one up if it's praise and, and, and prayer. Um, so I could concede that point without affecting my larger case in the slightest. That having been said, I do think there's evidence that he is using builds up sarcastically, and it's because his whole point throughout the passage is that, the, and not just this passage, but the text leading up to it, is that spiritual gifts are all about building up others. And um, it's his whole emphasis throughout the whole thing. And so I can, it seems very easily, uh, very plausible to me that he would use builds up in passing sarcastically to contrast the kind of building up that happens um, when you speak in, a, in the kind of tongue that you think makes you super awesome. That's the problem with the Corinthians. Uh, and then use the word in the way that you do everywhere else, which is positive. And, and I'll just add one last thing. I'll grant, even though I haven't done the word study yet, that the word there uh, and, its, and its cognates, like the one in Jude 20, um, does is used positively to refer to edification. Um, and and this very well may be the only place where he's using it negatively. But I, my response to that is, so what? I mean, you've already acknowledged that everywhere Paul uses the verb laleo and a dative object, it's the, the dative object understands the speech that is spoken. But you say that to himself in, you know, in 1 Corinthians 14 is the one exception. Well, so I'm willing to concede that the one exception to this word, meaning a positive building up is in this one verse. Well, it's the one exception because 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about a unique setting. He's talking about speaking in tongues. He's not talking about the kind of conversation that you and I are having right now. And furthermore, um, there, just, there has to be some sort of evidence from within these three chapters that uh, to, be, to edify here is not being used in a sincere and good way. And I agree, the, perp the ultimate purpose of all spiritual gifts 
is to edify and build up others. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that we cannot profit from and be edified by the exercise of our gift. Every time, my guess is every time you teach at your church or preach at a conference, you're built up by that. You're edified by it. But if you are, should you just stop and say, God, folks, I can't speak anymore because I'm actually profiting from this and that's awfully selfish and I feel like I'm elevating myself. Well, nobody thinks that way. Self-edification is a good thing. I think we're commanded to do it by Jude. Um, so everything we do as believers, people watching this uh, discussion are doing it because they want to be built up. Well, should we rebuke them and tell them to log off because it's a bad thing? Um, I, to, to try to find in self-edification something bad or negative or, or merely self-serving is, I think, misguided. I just don't think that that matches up to the way Paul uses that language. It may very well be misguided, and if I'm wrong, so be it. I, it's not something I, I have responses to what you just said, but I don't feel the need to belabor the point further because, as I said, even if I concede that point, the rest of my case remains unfazed. Okay. All right, let's We're, let's move on to some Q&A with the audience. Uh, this one's from Caleb Jackson. He sent this one earlier. Does Dr. Storms know of any documented cases of modern xenoglossia? To my understanding, glossolalia wasn't the dominant view of tongues until the 1900s. Uh, the word documented. I mean, these obviously. look like separate comments. Yeah, this this the first part is do you know of any documented cases of modern xenoglossia? Uh, it depends on what documentation means. Does he mean how would we document it other than by personal testimony? Um, and so I've, I've talked with, oh, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe upwards of eight individuals who've had profound encounters, um, very similar to what Chris would say is the function of tongues, uh, typically on a mission field in a, in a, in a crisis moment where uh, it became so very urgent that they'd be able to communicate in the language of the people that they're ministering to, and they were able to do that. Now, again, that's, um, that's not the kind of empirical uh, proof that, that you might otherwise want. It's anecdotal. Obviously, all personal testimonies are anecdotal. So, yeah, very, I, I've heard of a few doc, uh, cases of that sort, not many. Um, but I certainly, I mean, I'm, it's interesting that, you know, since Chris does believe that tongues is still valid for today, my assumption is he would say, yeah, there have to be some documented cases out there. I may not know of any, but uh, at least uh, hypothetically, I have to leave open the possibility that that's happening. Well, yeah, and it's my understanding that it is. Um, I don't have documentation per se, but a friend of mine named Mike or Michael Grenell is uh, in Sweden or Norway, somewhere in that area, and he recently published a book on miracles in which he alleges to document some xenoglossia, if I'm not mistaken. Unfortunately, I don't have an English translation of his book, so I don't know. Um, I have a friend of mine who related to me stories in which he observed or friends observed xenoglossia happening. Uh, but like Sam said, these aren't documented, at least not rigorously so. And so I wouldn't point to any example as definitive, but yeah, I'm absolutely open to this happening um, elsewhere around the globe. All right. Question Amen. from, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh yeah. Sorry. Do, the, uh, the other part of the question, did you want to answer that real quick? Uh, let's go back. To sorry. What was I, it again? I've got to pull it back up. He I'm was just saying it's his understanding down. that glossolalia wasn't the dominant interpretation until the 1900s. Dude, yeah. yeah. I can't, honestly, I can't speak to that. Uh, it may, that may well be the case. And if Chris has done the historical uh, research that I haven't, I, I'll rely on his, uh, his scholarship there, but that may well be the case. I don't know. No, does that give you any any sense of pause or concern? No, because so, uh, tongues in general was largely um, absent from the church from at least um, around the fifth or sixth century up until the present day, at least up until uh, the eighteenth, nineteenth centuries. So it wouldn't be at all surprising that there was no glossolalia occurring if tongues in and of itself was not occurring. And, you know, there, there are probably really once the ascendancy of Rome, uh, you know, concentrated spiritual ministry and gifting in the hands of the ordained clergy, uh, people did not have the Bible in their own language. Uh, they couldn't study the, the, the nature of this gift for themselves. It doesn't surprise me at all. 
that tongues might have waned. I'm not going to say it disappeared, but it certainly diminished in terms of its presence throughout the Christian world uh, until the last couple of centuries. Um, but again, um, I, I can't speak to that in any kind of definitive way. I haven't done the research. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on to a question from Popsicle Ocean. Dr. Storms, when someone speaks in tongues, such as uh, Sid Roth, how can we test whether it's true or a forgery? I don't know that you can. You know, and again, I'm not, uh, I don't know Sid Roth personally. Um, I trust that he's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so I, I don't know what is happening in his experience. I don't know that there is a way to test it. Um, certainly, you know, we would probably... We'd probably test it in the same way we would um, uh, prophecy or the exercise of other spiritual gifts. We would look at the fruit, look at the fruit of someone's life, look at the, you know, do we see them growing in Christ? Do we see them uh, extolling the, the glories of Jesus? Do we see them falling in greater love with the Word of God? Um, you know, the same kind of test that Jonathan Edwards applied to all the physical manifestations. Does, is this person increasing in their love for one another? Uh, is Jesus ever more central? So aside from the, the, the normal routine, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. How does a gift of the Spirit, how do we know if a gift of the Spirit is genuinely from God? Is it accompanied by the fruit of the Spirit? So all of those, again, they're a little slippery. They're not as, you know, objectively and empirically verifiable as we might like. But aside from that, I don't know that there is a way to test whether it's true or a forgery. I wouldn't know. Yeah, Any and I'll just like, yeah, I'll just read this brief quote from Norm Geisler. Um, those of you watching who know that I'm a Calvinist know that I probably don't have a lot of positive feelings about Norm Geisler, but but I do think this is a, a good quote. He says, even those who believe in modern tongues, by which he means glossolalia, acknowledge that unsaved people have tongues experiences. There's nothing supernatural about them. And I, and I explained how linguists have been able to show that there's nothing supernatural about them. But he goes on to say, there is something unique, however, about speaking complete and meaningful sentences and discourses in a knowable language to which one has never been exposed. And yeah, I think that is what makes tongue speaking a sign is because it is it is able to be, um, at least in most cases, discern, it's able to be discerned as something unexpected, something that that isn't easily faked. But it seems to me that glossolalia is easily faked, assuming that it, there are real instances of, real instance of it in the first place. And I would just, again, I'm, I know we're repeating ourselves here. I think the only way in which tongues function as a sign is the way in which Paul describes in verses 20 through 25, namely, um, as unintelligible speech to unbelievers, which Paul says, I don't want you to give because it will only confuse and confound and drive them away from the gospel and uh, lead them to a place where they are now under the judgment of God for their unbelief. So... But we've already beat that horse to, to death, so I guess we need to go back to it. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Here's our last super chat uh, of the day. So, breath of li bread of life says, "For both, how do you interpret the verse? For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful." Yeah, I um, I know what Chris believes, and I'll, but I'll let him articulate his view. Um, I think it, it, it seems to be one of two options, and it may be both. I acknowledge that in my book that it could be both. Does he mean my mind is unfruitful in the sense that I don't understand what I'm saying? Or is he saying my mind is unfruitful in that it's not bearing fruit in others who are listening to me? And I, I could conceivably agree to both of those. But given the fact that he says it is my mind that is unfruitful, not theirs. He doesn't say that when I pray in a tongue, they are unfruitful. Their minds don't comprehend. He says, my mind doesn't comprehend what I'm saying in a tongue. So that's my way of understanding that. Um, but again, I'm open to uh, the possibility that both could be true. And I know Chris holds the other view, so he may want to address that. Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Storms. I, I do hold the other view. Um, and I actually think that um, you wouldn't expect him to say the other person's mind is unfruitful because the whole point of bearing fruit is that the fruit is born from in the thing outwardly, right? So if I bear fruit amongst my community, that doesn't mean I'm the one that's uh, 
benefiting from what I'm doing, everybody else is. Fruitfulness flows outward. So when he says that my mind is unfruitful, I think what he's saying is my understanding that I have of what I'm saying isn't bearing fruit. And remember, he's talking about in in the context in the very context, he's talking about the importance of bearing fruit to your the people around you. Um, so then, and then the one other thing I'll just point out is that the Greek word here, nous, can mean mind. It often does, but there's also it also has the sense of my understanding. Uh, so, for example, in um, Philippians four seven. The very same author, Paul, says the peace of God surpasses all noose, surpasses all understanding. Uh, John in Revelation 13, 8 says that let the one who has noose, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. So I think what Paul is saying is not that my mind doesn't bear fruit, but that my understanding doesn't bear fruit, um, which if true would, would lend it even more to the Xenolalia reading. Again, Unfruitful doesn't mean I don't understand. Unfruitful means nobody, I'm not, my my mind isn't bearing fruit outwardly to the people around me. Yeah, and I, I would just disagree with that. I just, I think he's saying, um, he says, my mind is unfruitful. And then he says, what am I going to do? If it's not, if it's not, if I don't understand what I'm saying, should I just stop? I mean, it seems like that would be a useless endeavor. And he says, no, no, no. I'm going to do both. I'm going to pray with my spirit, that is in tongues, and I'm going to pray with my mind, that is in a way that I understand in the vernacular of the people. So you know, I'm going to sing with the spirit, I'm going to sing with the mind. Just, just to be clear, though, my reading makes just as good a sense of those verses. So if Paul says, if I pray in a foreign human language and my hearers don't understand, then I'm my spirit prays, but my understanding isn't bearing fruit. So what will I do? I won't only pray with my spirit. I won't only pray fervently, but I will do so with my understanding as well, meaning I will use, I will allow my understanding to bear fruit as intended. So I just don't agree with you that these verses <clears throat> lend them more to the glossolalia reading than mine. And in the same way, I don't agree with you that it's Xenolalia there. So that's why we're having this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Um, one thing I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, and we, we you guys talked about this for maybe like 20 minutes during the, the back and forth, but I, I wanted to maybe get some clarity on it and then we can close out the show. Um, it has to do with, with Paul praying in tongues in private. And uh, I forget what, what verse it is. I'm not the expert here. But um, Chris, on your view, when he is praying in tongue, tongues in private, he's speaking in different language, right? He's speaking another English language, or not not English, human language. <sighs> he's speaking he's speaking another human language. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, so, but like, what would doesn't that seem strange? Like speaking another human language. Well, so first of all, Paul never claims that he prays privately in tongues. That's uh, an inference that Dr. Storms and other charismatics make, which is fine, but it's not mm -hmm. what Paul says. He just says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Um, if your question, however, is when Paul advises someone who would speak in tongues but can't translate it for the rest of the congregation, what then would be the purpose of having that person, instead of speaking aloud, speak quietly to himself there in the congregation mm -hmm. so as not to be heard? Well, because if the person is being gifted with this prayer or this praise of God in another language that no one understands, there's still value in the person praying that and praising God, even if nobody can hear. So if you get if you are supernaturally gifted with this prompting from the spirit, but you can't translate it for anybody and there's nobody to translate it for you, well, then don't just abandon it entirely. Keep, pray it to yourself. Pray it in, in your pew or your seat quietly. Praise God privately. quietly in, in, quietly in the tongue, privately in one sense of the word. Um, yeah. But you're still in the congregation. It's just you're doing it quietly so as not to disrupt the rest of the service. Hmm. Yeah, I will. Let me just, uh, I'll say one final comment. And this again is purely personal, experiential. And uh, I, I do not base my belief in what I've articulated on it. But I remember when I first received the gift of tongues, um, it was an absolutely stunning, uh, the most supernaturally charged moment in my life. I wasn't trying to speak in tongues. 
I wasn't saying banana backwards over and over. Uh, I, I was sitting quietly um, uh, under a tree at the McKinley Elementary School uh, parking lot uh, there in Norman, Oklahoma, just a, way, a few blocks from my fraternity house. And I had been asking God for this gift for quite some time. And I'm just sitting there. And I mean, there was a sudden invasion. That's the only thing I know how to say. And I believe it was of the Spirit of God. Somebody else might want to say, oh, it was a demon. I don't believe that. It was the most glorious moment of deep and profound intimacy in which I felt the love and the affection of God. I sensed his powers like heaven. The veil between heaven and earth had just been ripped away. And I can still remember the cadence, the words, the language, and it didn't sound anything remotely like a language that I that anybody spoke anywhere in the world. Now, maybe Chris would want to argue that if that was a legitimate experience from the Spirit, even though it didn't seem like a, another human language, it was. I'm just absolutely convinced that it wasn't. I think it was a heavenly dialect that the Spirit of God had uniquely crafted for me uh, that I now pray and and uh, and praise in every single day the rest of my life. Now, again, I'm not saying, hey, look at my experience and believe my arguments on 1 Corinthians 14. I'm just simply saying that I have had an experience that I believe is perfectly consistent with what I read in the New Testament. And I appreciate that, um, and I respect that. Um, I'm sure, Dr. Storms, you would agree that, you know, Mormons say the same thing when they say that sure. I have a burning in the bosom. Um, and so My bosom didn't burn. <laughs> that's right. You just you just ate something, and now you've got uh, acid reflux. Uh, but but um, uh, so I agree with you there, and, and I just I'm thankful, as I'm sure Dr. Storms is as well, that that's why we have the sole infallible rule of faith and practice in Scripture to help us arbitrate this debate. And I'm sure that Dr. Storms, you're doing your best to make that your ultimate authority and not your experience. And I'm doing likewise. Um, and I think it's a beautiful thing that we can we can disagree and yet still enjoy each other's company as brothers. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Hey, Cameron, is it all right for an advertisement? Absolutely. Can I recommend my book, The Language I'll, of Heaven, Crucial Questions About Speaking in Tongues? Um, and obviously, it goes, it's a 230-page uh, book, so it goes into a lot of other issues that we weren't able to discuss today. So, And I'm sure yeah, Chris has a lot online as well, uh, even though you may not have a book. I know you've done a lot of study on this, so feel free to recommend it. Ooh, is that okay, Cam, for a moment? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Sure. And, and maybe put me up screen, full screen as well for a reason I'll explain in a second. So I don't actually have any books on this topic, but I do have um, episodes of my uh, show, The Apologetics, on YouTube. I've got a couple of episodes on tongues, including a couple of episodes leading up to this debate in which I was reviewing um, chapter four, I think, of Dr. Storms' book that he just showed you um, to show why I don't think his case for glossolalia holds up. I was going to continue doing that up until this debate, but then certain things happened in my family life that Cameron, you're aware of, um, and so that kind of derailed me for a bit. The reason, though, that I asked you to put me up full screen is because although I don't have any books on this topic, I do on other topics, including most notably these two right here. So this is Rethinking Hell, Readings in Evangelical Conditionalism, and this is A Consuming Passion, um, Essays on Hell and Immortality in Honor of Edward Fudge. Um, I'm much more versed in the topic of the hell debate and am much more well known for that. Um, and I would love for people to check out my work at RethinkingHell.com. Um, and they can find information about those books and all my other stuff at chrisdate.info. So thank hey, you. Chris, Chris, quick question unrelated yeah. to our topic today. Is Edward Fudge still alive? Sadly, no. He passed away a few years ago. Okay. I just wasn't aware of that. I read his I read his book way back when. I didn't know if he was still alive. He he I think it was eight, 2018 he passed away. It was uh um we were we were really thankful to have been able to publish that book, uh, A Consuming Passion. It was a festschrift in Edward Fudge's honor, and we, we were really thankful to have been able to publish that and present it to him in person before he passed. Um, so, but thank you for asking. Hey, you bet. Do, do you do you guys have time for one more question on topic? I do. I guess. Sure. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like yeah, a no. A very we, no. We, we, like, we can rest. No, gotta well, this honest. is... Uh, if this isn't this isn't going to like spark a debate or anything, but I, I am just curious on what uh, on the way that Sam would would answer this. So, 
it seems to me like if Chris's view is correct, suppose that like every instance of tongues that occurred nowadays was was the type of tongues that Chris has in mind, which another human tongue or it's another human language. And mm. wouldn't that serve as like a really like big, powerful evidence for Christianity if like that was sure. happening a lot? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so it'd be like a big sign to unbelievers. Honestly, honestly, if if his view is correct, and therefore all these people who like me who who pray in tongues are actually exercising xenoglalia, I think it'd be great. I have no objection to that. I think it'd be wonderful. I just don't think it's required from the New Testament. But yeah, I have no objection to that. Hmm. Okay, I, I wish it was that easy, Cameron. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish yeah. that were what happening so that I'd win the yeah. debate. But unfortunately, yeah. it's not the way it is. Yeah, that would be that'd be pretty cool. Anyways, uh, I, I appreciate both of you guys coming on. Uh, this has been really, really insightful. It's not it's not a topic that I've personally studied, but it was it was fun to. I mean, what I like to do is I'll, I like to sit back and listen while I have people like debating different topics. And some days I'm able to actually like, get up and walk around, and I do my best thinking while I'm like moving around. So I was able to do that. It was really cool. But I appreciate both of you guys coming on. This was really fun. So <laughs> well, it was. I appreciate it very much, Dr. Storms, and I had a very good time, and I hope you did as well. And and Cameron, um, it'll probably encourage you to know that I think both views are represented within Roman Catholicism. I don't think that the papacy has spoken ex cathedra, you know, or, or infallibly on what the nature of, of the gift of tongues is. So I think you'd probably be free to follow the evidence where you where you see it leading. All right. Well, again, thank you guys both for coming on. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, I've got links to, to both guys in the description of the video if you'd like to learn more. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work. People like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?